Okay, I presume you guys can hear me. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, our conversation this morning, um, as most of our conversations touched on the COVID-19 pandemic, and it's really been a time of testing for us individually and um, uh, for our congregation as a whole. And if you think about comparisons, you know, right way back in March, uh, Dave was asking how many times the church closed uh, during the 1918 influenza uh, pandemic. We looked it up and the church was closed for three Sundays in the fall of, of 1918. So that, while it's a very good uh, comparison for the health crisis facing the country, it's not a very good uh, comparison for our church or congregation. And that led me to think more about the 1975 church fire uh, as a, another time of testing uh, and since there is a fair amount of material in the church archives and a number of people in the congregation who, um, uh, who lived through that experience and whom I could get in touch with, I decided to focus on, on uh, and look further into the 1975 uh, uh, church fire. Let's see if I can, there we go. Um, what I want to do is... Um, uh, touch a little bit on what happened and the congregation's response. Uh, certainly invite your memories and comments on, at the end. I see Larry Frick and Charles Metz are on this call and, and, and they experienced it. Um, uh, Mart, you were certainly around for uh, at least the, uh, the back end of this um, experience. Um, but on October 1st, 1975, early in the morning, let's say about 1.30, maybe a little bit after that, Donna Gilliam, the wife of our senior minister, Jim Gilliam, called Bill and Judy Lutz uh, to say that uh, Bill needed to get down to the church. Uh, the building was on fire and the Montclair Counseling Center, which he had started three years earlier, um, uh, was in flames. So they came down to the church and the first thing they saw was the east window, that's the round window over the handicapped parking spaces in the driveway, was glowing red from the, um, from the heat of the fire. Um, the Gilliams also called uh, Bob Frick, Larry's dad, who was then uh, president of the congregation, and of course he came down. And Herb Yeager, who the associate minister who lived across the street at P2, joined the group. So. The Gilliams, the Lutzes, Bob Frick, Herb Yeager, perhaps another one or two, stood uh, vigil uh, all night watching the, uh, uh, the Montclair firemen uh, 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 tackle the fire. There was one other uh, member of the church who also showed up, and that was Tom Pugh, who was then the secretary of the, of the congregation. Uh, but uh, he was an auxiliary fireman so he heard about it through uh, from the fire department and he collected other uh, auxiliary firemen to come down to the church and fight the fire and uh, was there all night long. Um, this photo uh, of the firemen probably toward morning, they're on the uh, roof of the portico at the entrance to the sanctuary from the back driveway. You can see the conic windows underneath and they punched holes through the roof in order to try to get the water onto, um, onto the beams that were on fire. Uh, this man on the left, this firefighter over here is Tom Pugh, the secretary of the uh, congregation. Uh, so to take a step back, um, three teenage boys, uh, 15 and 14 years old, were partying behind the church. They broke into the church through a rear door. Um, they took an amplifier for our public address system, ransacked a closet. Uh, communion cups were found scattered inside and outside the building afterwards. It's not clear whether they kind of exploded out of the building or, or uh, had been taken by the kids. And the fire was apparently started in more than one place. One theory was that the boys had been making their around, way around at night with candles and one of the can, uh, candle caught one of the curtains on fire. Um, although the fire seems to have been started in more than one place. The alarm was raised at 1.34 in the morning. 
Montclair Fire and police arrived minutes later and they found the building, as they said, totally involved in fire. And all Montclair, Montclair Fire personnel were called out. Uh, the Montclair uh, Ambulance Unit responded with three vehicles, one of which had a searchlight, which helped the uh, firemen um, uh, make their way around the building. Another one uh, uh, ministered to uh, 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 the firefighters who were injured. Three of them were injured, two were sent to hospital. It took all night to, um, to control the fire. Um, there was concern that the entire building would be uh, lost. Word of the fire spread fairly quickly uh, and members of the church came by in the morning and one of them was uh, Cliff Lindholm II, uh, father to uh, Cliff Lindholm whom uh, we all know. And um, he uh, took some uh, film, um, super, uh, super eight millimeter film, uh, which uh, I found in the archives and had converted to a DVD this film is, is pretty grainy. It's, it's, it's uh, almost in color, I can put it that way. It's silent, uh, but what it gives is a sense of, of what the church members found uh, first thing in the morning when they um, uh, came to um, Cooper Avenue. Oops. There we should show up here. There we are. I'll provide some commentary as we go through the film, but you see the firemen um, packing up in the morning, inspecting the damage. Um, I'll pause it there. This is the east, the rose window on the east facing Dave Shaw's house um, uh, that Bill Lutz found um, glowing red when he arrived. And you can see here now in the morning, you can look through that window and through the roof of the, uh, uh, of the building to see the sky on the far end. One of the ladders still against the building. This is the back driveway. You can see all the detritus on the, on the ground, very moist. This is the guild room. Um, uh, which was uh, completely consumed by fire. Although Beth Pugh recalls that the two, one thing that didn't burn were the birch logs in the fireplace in the Gildan. <laughs> <laughs> now this, um, Bill Lutz, this is the view, I think from the driveway, looking into the back of the sanctuary. Bill Lutz recalls that so much water was poured onto the building to fight the fire that uh, when they opened these doors, about six or eight inches of water rushed out of the, uh, uh, out the doors uh, uh, from the floor of the sanctuary. You see the the uh, well the mess on the on the pews from the uh, from the roof when it burned. Here you can see that the fire went all the way through the roof. Um, this is looking toward the back of the sanctuary, as is this. You see the back was changed in the restoration. I think this may be the basement in the scout room, maybe. Tim, can you, um, I, I just saw something. Can you just back up a few frames? Uh, it looked like a view of the back wall of the sanctuary with some windows up at the top. It's probably too far. Uh, well, we get another view of the back later on. Uh, okay. Let's see. Yeah, it, it was after that. It was after that. Well, let's see if we can uh, speak up, Armin, next time, and I'll try to stop it. Yeah, OK. Again, I think that may be the basement. I'm not sure. There's some more of the back, uh, uh, Armin. Not very clear. But...
That again is the guild room. I'll have still photographs that show this in more detail. Beth Pugh also recalls that there was a sofa that had been, I think this is the assembly room. And, and Paul, this is for you. I sent you a still of this, but Paul Sionis has been wondering, was the tower actually enclosed at one point? And indeed it was closed on three, on three sides before the chandelier was put in. And, and this is, uh, these were the doors and fan lights in each of the three sides. Um, and it was used by scouts and youth groups and perhaps others as a, as a meeting space. Thanks, Tim. Well, also Michelle's father was a fire captain at that time. So I'm looking to see if he's in the photos. Oh, well, maybe you'll, uh, let's see who uh, else not, is not coming out. Clear. Uh, what? They're not that clear for faces. Yeah, they're not very clear. More in the back of the uh, church and the devastation to the roof. Wow. I'll just pause there again. Beth Pugh recalls a kind of humorous story that one of the sofas taken out of the guild room uh, as the, and, and sitting on the front lawn and as the fire trucks were uh, beginning to pull away, it spontaneously burst, uh, burst into flames. So people were running out to the fire trucks to get them to come back to um, uh, put out the flames in the sofa. I'm not sure, Charles, you may remember. I'm wondering if that's Herb Yeager on the left. No, that was Jim Gilliam. I saw him before he turned. Oh, is this is this Jim Gilliam, the senior yes. minister then? Okay. And then the church was hosting a Chinese congregation at the time. And I'm wondering if that might have been the pastor of the Chinese congregation. So that's good to know. That's uh, Jim Gilliam was was really important in all of this. And Tim, was it Jim's? Did Jim have his office in the tower? Uh, no, I don't think so. His office was over in the Vincent building. Yes, yeah. I think that must have been, may have been George Vincent. Okay. Anyway, um, I don't, I haven't found any photos of the damage upstairs in the East Wing, the choir room and the Montclair Counseling Center and such, but here starting east and moving west, these are photos that were taken by the Montclair Times on the morning of the first. Uh, the, uh, the guild room, uh, you know, the windows and doors uh, burst out, the uh, piano's a complete loss, stairs still in place, but I understand that a carpet, the room had just been recarpeted just weeks or months before. Um, the kitchen, I don't have the original of the uh, photograph, but this is a, a photo that appeared in a, in a newspaper or a newsletter, uh, and it's clear enough to show just how badly uh, uh, damaged the uh, kitchen was with the rafters falling down, the windows, doors blown out. Wow. Uh, this is where we normally meet to have breakfast outside the kitchen. Um, you know, the ladies room in the back and, and the, uh, the closet, at least where the, where the uh, 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 communion uh, service uh, cups and, uh, uh, and such are kept. Uh, I don't know if they were kept there at the time. You can see there was a room divider that went, uh, and the accordion uh, divider was, uh, of course, burned. Uh, moving into the assembly room, um, which you'll see looks look different at the time. Uh, the kitchen in the middle, middle right, and the, that area outside the kitchen in the lower right. Um, again, soaked with water, uh, a mess. Uh, at the time, uh, both the balcony and the lower areas had been uh, uh, enclosed to create Sunday school rooms. Um, of course, they were taken out in the restoration, but that's uh, uh, moving into the sanctuary. Again, the debris on the floor, um, the, what these were called deacon's benches at the back. Uh, we're looking out toward the driveway. You can see the tree in the, the backyard across the way on Summit Avenue. Um, 
all the hymnals, of course, were completely soaked and had to be uh, tossed. And you can see how close uh, uh, the fire got to the conic windows underneath. Uh, but they uh, survived unscathed. Mm. Um, the Tiffany windows, Charles reminds me that a ladder uh, uh, knocked one piece out of the uh, Tiffany windows that was later replaced and was not an exact color match. But the Tiffany windows also came through remarkably well. Another photo of the of the uh, roof. Uh, there's kind of four bays here in the lower right. This is the beginning of the bay that goes to the front of the sanctuary up to the edge of the chancel. So um, the the fire traveled really rather far into the sanctuary. And then this is outside. This is kind of this is where the firemen were in that uh, photo I showed uh, at the very beginning and um, uh, shows the damage to, uh, to the roof. And then you can see again, how close it was to the, uh, to the conic windows. Um, the congregation responded with uh, uh, remarkable speed and neighbors as well. Um, Bob Frick and Jim Gilliam sent a, um, uh, a letter to the congregation by the end of the day, full of determination um, uh, for um, uh, moving forward. And Bob's phrase was that countless angels showed up. Um, they began to clean up, salvage the furnishings to the extent they could, retrieve and scour china and flatware. Um, one Alice Lockwood organized a lot of that. Uh, Larry tells me that Janet, he and Janet were there that day on the first to help with the, uh, the cleanup. All the choir and clerical robes completely saturated with smoke who were sent out for, for cleaning. Um, Cliff Lindholm tells me that they just couldn't get the smoke out and the choir robes had to be uh, discarded. Um, Cliff, uh, after taking the film that I showed went over to the Vincent building and found Jim Gilliam. And he says, Art Manning, who's the president who succeeded um, Bob Frick, but I wonder if it was Bob, uh, and told them that he would be willing to um, uh, uh, take the lead on, on what was called limit, limiting the loss. And Cliff um, uh, took immediate steps to get a local contractor to uh, to put plywood on the roof, it covered the tarps until it could be, uh, the rest with tarps until it could be uh, covered with plywood um, and, and secure the buildings, uh, security guard. He found a firm out in Sussex County that would, before the end of the week, uh, uh, remove all the, uh, the pews and the altar and store them uh, until decisions were made about restoring them. And the, and the pews were, uh, and the altar were uh, restored and, and put back in afterwards. Uh, the church was lucky in part that the, the, the beams supporting the roof were wood. The, the thought at the time was, is had they been steel beams, the temperature was so high that the, the, the steel might have uh, crumpled and the walls would have fallen in. But the uh, wood um, uh, did not burn through and the walls did not collapse. Um, during the day, Jim Gilliam uh, uh, had arranged a place for the church to meet for, for Sunday worship uh, and, and put out that letter that I mentioned. Um, in the evening, the governing board met and a challenge to the governing board. This was the first year, 1975, of, the, of our current organizational structure with the leadership council, then called a governing board. It had been a church council and board of trustees uh, framework before that. Um, the governing board confirmed Cliff Lindholm and his role of taking emergency action to prevent uh, additional damage and conserve property. And um, uh, they called a congregational meeting uh, 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 for October 26 to elect uh, a building committee. Um, the next Sunday, um, uh, the church gathered at, at Mount Hebron, now Buzz Aldrin School, in the auditorium. Uh, Larry remembers that Jim Gilliam made a splendid choice for the first hymn of uh, We Would Be Building, that old E&R, that well, was not so old, but that E&R hymn to the Finlandia tomb, a tune, and you can imagine how, uh, 
how uh, people must have raised their voices, uh, lou uh, singing loudly when they were singing that. It was Worldwide Communion Sunday, so members of the church had made homemade bread and loaves were passed through the, uh, the rows of, of, of the auditorium. And they used the communion cups that had been scattered four days earlier uh, and cleaned. Uh, if we were meeting in person, I would show you some examples of the soot-stained communion cups. A uh, few were set aside and put into the uh, church archives, along with, by the way, the lectern Bible that was completely crinkled from the, uh, the um, uh, uh, fire. Uh, fire. I'm hearing some music. I'm wondering if that's my uh, computer in the background, but as long as it doesn't disturb you. Uh, Jim Gilliam's sermon was the God of the Ashes, and his, he ended with this sentence, the heart of Union Church cannot be burned. We shall demonstrate to this community what it means to be up and alive everywhere. And Beth Pugh recalls that, that uh, Jim Gilliam had actually felt that his work was done at Union Church and had not yet announced, but had decided to uh, leave and look for another pastorate. But with this fire, he agreed. He, he did not make that announcement and he stayed for another couple of years to help guide the church through the, uh, the aftermath. For the next 15 months, the church uh, uh, worshiped down at the women's club. This is a sign that was put out at, uh, in front of the church. You can see the debris on the uh, porch outside the assembly room. I think the senior high group also met at the women's club. The Montclair Counseling Center moved over to St. James, but everything else squeezed into the Vincent building. It was a feat of scheduling and <laughs> use of space, but the work of the church carried on uh, using the Vincent building to the degree possible. And of course, uh, we're a congregational church, so there were committees. Uh, the key one, in addition to the limit loss committee was the building committee and care was taken for the 11 members to have a mix of old and young, male and female. There was a youth member Bill Knowles chaired it and did a fantastic job by all accounts. One of the key subcommittees, uh, the architect subcommittee went through some 30 firms before recommending um, Welcome. one of them. We're glad that you're here to work and I'm going to try to, I don't know. First Sunday in Lent. Uh, you know that Lent lasts the whole That's what I'd done, sorry. <laughs> I failed to um, uh, turn off my YouTube. Um, and there was also an insurance claim subcommittee that uh, uh, played an important role, of course, uh, uh, getting the information, the cost estimates and all that to put the claim in um, uh, was an enormous task. And toward the end, there was a, another committee formed to uh, plan the rededication in, in um, April, May of, of 1977. And I go through the records and there are so many familiar names. Uh, I mentioned Bob Frick, Larry's father as president, uh, Tom Pugh as secretary, Beth's father. Cleo Nesbitt was chair of the Women's Guild, the mother of Judy. You know, Bill Lutz, whom we all recall was uh, there as head of the Montclair Counseling Center. Cliff Lindholm, I've mentioned a couple of times. He also was a liaison with the Boy Scouts for their needs. And Betty Jane Bailey uh, became Minister of Parish Education from September 1976. And uh, Janet, Janet Metz was on the Rededication Committee. So people we know just really came through um, uh, in this uh, time of testing. Uh, to describe the, the process of, of putting in the insurance claims and, and, and Hiring the architect and coming up with uh, the rebuilding plans uh, uh, is it's, it's a little bit more than I want to tackle this morning. This one chart, I think, helps to show um, uh, just how much effort went into it. This is about a four by six uh, piece of blue construction paper. I put it on the floor and took a photo. Uh, I think Bill Knowles must have done it. Somebody did it. But really laying out the tasks um, between the end of October uh, when the building committee was formed and the end of January when the annual meeting took place. Uh, annual meetings took place in January then not at the end of February. Uh, two person um, uh, subcommittees were formed for various tasks. You can see their names in red here. 
um, and then laid out when the meetings would take place and, and visiting staff, visiting all the community groups that use the church, um, uh, just touching base, uh, lots of communication, both through letters um, from um, uh, the minister and the president, but also articles in Dimension. These are, these are mentioned here, reports back to the governing board, another article Dimension, and all of this to, uh, by the annual meeting at the end of, of, of January to have a recommendation for um, how to proceed and which architect to, um, to uh, hire. One of the interesting parts of this process was that the two person subcommittee surveyed every department and unit in the church, as well as all the community groups that use the facilities to identify needs and desires. And these are all spiral bound in this, with this blue cover and it got called the blue book. Um, the results of this survey were reported at the annual meeting in January and they, they guided discussions with the architect about the, uh, the restoration. Uh, not everything uh, uh, that was suggested certainly was acted on. I've exposed uh, this other page here shows that um, uh, at least two members of the clergy were recommending strongly that it would be great to get greater flexibility in the sanctuary by having movable pews. And if that wasn't possible, to at least have movable pews for the front of the, of the sanctuary, uh, directly in front of the chancel. And is there any way we could get better sight lines for the side pews, uh, the pews in the side aisles, that sort of thing. The, so uh, there's pages and pages of this and the building committee kind of you know, put X's over some of the numbers and circled other numbers uh, and, and the circled ones were the ones they focused on um, um, uh, going forward. Uh, the photo on the left is of the scaffolding that was needed by the, uh, put in place by the contractor to come up with the cost estimate for the insurance claim. Um, uh, the rebuilding plan was developed uh, with the architect and presented at a special meeting in, uh, toward the end of May 1976. By that point, the building committee had met 22 times since the fire. Uh, the text, a script for their presentations in the archives, and they really did a very good job of um, reporting on all that had gone into the plan and what they hoped to achieve. The key objective was to restore and enhance the beauty of the church. And the cost estimates came in at, at $970,000. It kind of shows you how construction costs have ballooned in the last 45 years. Uh, the vast majority was covered by the insurance settlement of 805,000. And that number is kind of halfway between what the church claimed and what the insurance company wanted to pay. And after going back and forth two or three times, they settled on this number. 33,000 had already been contributed. If you recall, the mid seventies were a period of high interest. So 7,000 had already been earned in interest. And the recommendation to the congregation was to, uh, undertake a, a new capital campaign to raise $125,000 um, to cover the rest of the costs. The resolution to proceed was approved unanimously. And uh, uh, the reports are that, that the, uh, the members of the congregation gave a standing ovation to the building committee for their work um, in, in coming up with the plan. There were three professional advisors who played a really important role in the whole process. Um, on the right there, that's Levon Kachadorian. Armin tells me that that's the same name as Kachadorian, although he never found any clue that they were related. Um, uh, Levon Kachadorian's firm, Kachadorian and Cahill was in Bloomfield. Um, he was hired, as I say, 30 firms or so were reviewed. But he had, in his early career in Britain, had been involved with the restoration of a number of churches damaged during the Second War. When Park United Methodist Church in Bloomfield was struck by lightning, he, he had the task of restoring that building. A uh, grammar school in Glen Ridge had burned. He, his firm was responsible for restoring that. And they had also handled some 30 school restorations in Newark. So. Uh, he brought a lot of experience uh, and sensitivity to the task. The contractor chosen both for the cost estimate for the insurance claim and then for the reconstruction rebuilding 
was Willard Peterson, whose family firm, the O.A. Peterson Construction Company, was based here in Montclair, and, and Willard Peterson lived in Upper Montclair. At that meeting in May, the building committee also recommended the hiring of a, of a design consultant because there were gonna be umpteen decisions about you know, the color of the carpets, the paint, the, um, the this and the that. And they uh, recommended Barbara Schirmeister, who was an um, interior decorator, has um, worked with the Stadler Hilton hotel, hotel chain and been responsible for the decorating of the Waldorf Astoria Towers. And, had some private clients in Short Hills. She was also a member of the Short Hills Community Church, so she understood how congregational churches um, make decisions. Um, the goal was to get back into the sanctuary. Um, the first service was January 2nd, 1977, so just uh, seven months after the vote at that special meeting to proceed. Some 500 people attended, and Chandler Grannis and his uh, history uh, uh, remarked on a, a spirit of spontaneous thanksgiving and celebration. And Mark, this first special service, as, as you no doubt remember, was Betty Jane's uh, ordination on January 16th, uh, 1977. Again, she had become our minister for parish education the prior September. Uh, while the church was able to continue to uh, get back to worshiping in the sanctuary, work continued till the end of March in the assembly room, the kitchen, the guild room, the rest of the East Wing, and, and uh, practically the most important thing for many people was bathrooms. Um, uh, if you can imagine it, there was no men's bathroom on the, anywhere on the first floor of the building. And uh, some of the older men were uh, uh, finding it difficult to come to church. Um, uh, so bathrooms were added in the West Wing, the men's room, bathroom off the assembly hall, and then that one at the far east end of the, uh, of the building. Um, in the restoration of the sanctuary, the emphasis was on design integrity and in, in what they called the Norman style. And so where it had been pretty much a blank back wall, they added these rounded arches and Everything got stained dark. Uh, it had been very light oak before this, but it all went very dark. Maybe that felt more medieval, more Norman. Um, the crenellated molding, which you see on the back of these benches and uh, doors was, was matching what's on the, um, uh, the complete other end on the chancel wall. Uh, wrought iron railings and fittings were also felt to be Norman style. These chandeliers were put in for the first time the quatrefoil design, um, I'll show a little bit more in the front, but you can see the quatrefoil there, even on the chandelier, that theme was carried uh, without. I think these pilasters um, in the back, and they're repeated in the front are not structural. They were new, both in the front and the back, but they, with this molding on the top. What was not emphasized in terms of the, uh, the worship space was, was multiple uses or, or, or flexibility. Uh, these doors to the, uh, to the assembly room were punched through the wall and, and to make egress a little bit easier. And in the front, um, again, this, the, the dark wood, um, uh, these, these molding, these pilasters were added. The chancel had been divided with panels, wood panels, and one of the goals was to get better sight lines. So uh, these, this open, um, ironwork, wrought ironwork was introduced. And this um, wrought iron, um, I mean, the quatrefoil design there is repeated in the, in the organ screens. Of course, the organ had been a complete mess. Every pipe had to be taken out and cleaned and, and the organ reconstructed. Um, the, the slate in the chancel floor was added after this point. Um, and all this pushed toward um, a rededication weekend um, a three-day event uh, with concerts and tree plantings. Uh, the children of the church um, uh, came up with the idea of a time capsule and, and Betty Jane Bailey worked with them on that. Um, it was supposed to be opened in 50 years. So far, five years from now, we're supposed to find a time capsule. I'm not sure where it is. It may be in the ramp that was added uh, at this time. Uh, but we know what's in the time capsule because um, 
uh, Betty Jane's notes on, on the contents are in the files in the archive. Uh, there was a dinner on this on Saturday, uh, April 30th, um, uh, with a congregational meeting, I think mostly to congratulate those who had done such good work. Uh, the rededication service on May 1st and a, and a festival of music uh, later in the afternoon. Uh, you can see the quatrefoil design was, was emphasized in the, um, on the covers of these uh, bulletins. And during the service, a, a uh, Union Congregational Church Scholarship Fund at Talladega College uh, was announced and, 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 and uh, a trustee of Talladega College was there to receive the first $4,000 check and a pledge for an additional 11,000 over the, uh, the, uh, the next couple of years. So I think it essentially it was a $15,000 scholarship fund. College was cheaper in those days too. So uh, just some thoughts of, you know, comparing uh, times of testing, uh, I'm sure, uh, you guys will come up with uh, with others very quickly. Uh, they, I think they, I mean, you, certainly you can call them times of testing. The church fire was more of something that happened suddenly, uh, an enormous challenge to respond, but kind of the steps were pretty clear. You had to salvage what you could, come up with a cost estimate for the insurance claim, hire the architect, decide how you wanted to reconstruct, et cetera, et cetera. Our COVID-19 pandemic has kind of been the kind of an unfolding cumulative test and, and it's never, we're never quite sure when it's gonna end or, or what our next steps are. Um, the church fire had the congregation out of the sanctuary for 15 months. We've been out for 12 months so far, but I think we're gonna beat that 1975 to 77 record. Um, the challenge in 1975 was worshiping in a different space. Uh, our challenge has been worshiping in a different medium. Uh, the work is of the church has continued in both instances. Uh, in 75, in person, kind of crowded into the Vincent building, our work has continued in a virtual space. Um, the, uh, uh, the fire in 1975 took uh, led to a fresh look at how our spaces for worship, uh, 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 at our spaces for worship and community meetings. And the COVID-19 pandemic is, is raising kind of really interesting questions uh, uh, about a fresh look at how we worship, um, accessibility, flexibility, uh, uh, connection and such and what cre creates and sustains uh, community, uh, both in person and, and virtually. So let me stop there. And uh, I'm outside, out of uh, Zoom. Can you guys, uh, so I'm not sure I can see anybody, but um, maybe we could carry on a conversation. Tim, may I ask a question? Sure. Um, I seem to remember seeing older photos of the sanctuary with semicircular pews. And yeah, those are, thinking... those are, those go back some decades before that. Tim, okay. can you stop sharing your screen? What? There, there you go. That's there. Better. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Now I can see everybody. <laughs> I was thinking that those were present right up to the point of the fire, but that's no. not the case. No, they, they had been replaced at some point, uh, uh, I think in the 50s with, uh, with uh, uh, blonde pews, the ceiling beams were blonde, the columns were green, the walls were green. So uh, the, the, the pews with the rounded ends uh, set more at an angle, not four square like uh, we've had recently, um, uh, were uh, uh, in the decades before the 50s. Is there any insight as to why the more squared approach was taken with subsequent pews? One of the key reasons that, uh, it's not entirely clear to me, Rob, but I think one of the key reasons was to try to expand the seating capacity of the, uh, of the church in the 1950s when you know, church attendance all over the country and in Montclair just exploded. So they were, hmm. they were trying to expand the capacity of the room. So that did it, I see. Yeah. Uh -huh. More efficient use of More space. More efficient use of what space, yeah. Uh -huh. 
Uh, One of the interesting um, uh, pieces of data that we also have on file is the original blue, blueprint uh, architectural drawings of Kajiturian and Cahill uh, that they, I guess, are uh, prepared in 1975-76 for the rebuilding, which shows the, the straight pews. But then prior to that, we have the 1950s, as I think um, Tim referred to, uh, the, uh, the horseshoe or the semicircular designs that were in place then. And just so that everybody's aware, all of these are now digitized. And uh, even though they're only interested interesting to those that are really into architectural drawings and the history, we do actually have them uh, available for people to actually peruse. Hmm. Uh, Tim, do you recall the, um, the picture of the back of the sanctuary? Yes. George Sanctuary, there was a cross over the uh, assembly room. Yeah. That was fabricated by Ray Riley from uh, one of the beams that had been, it had to be taken out there, there were chestnut wood, and he managed to salvage enough wood to, to uh, fabricate that cross. Yeah, thanks, Charles. I meant to mention that. And uh, Ray Riley was a member of the business of the uh, building committee, but I think he also had done graduate work in design. So that's um, uh, a beautiful cross. And Dave, I think you have a cross that the Lutzes gave you that they got from the Gilliams. At least that's what Judy says. That was also a, presumably a much smaller one that was also made from the salvage timber. It was actually given to me by uh, Jim's son. Okay. Um, he came out to visit uh, first couple of months after I started and said that his mom had found it in their house and that they didn't want to keep it in Washington State, that it belonged back in New Jersey. And so it's now on my wall. And whenever I depart the office, it will stay there. I have a question about the pews, uh, Tim, sorry. Um, the original pews were, were kept and stored somewhere, is that right? That's right. And, yeah. and they were then, what became of the, I guess they weren't chosen because they were that light color. They were light the, color, they were restained. When they were refinished, uh, they were stained the dark color that we made. I see, so the, the, those, are the, those are the original pews back in well, the- Back from the place. 50s, yeah. 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 I got a Tim, I got a couple couple of things I'd like to add. Um, yeah, those pews are oak. They're solid oak. They're quite heavy. Um, that piece of I was going to mention Ray Riley's cross, and I'm glad that Charlie brought it up. It's a beautiful cross, and I I added a when we did the relighting, I made sure that we put a light on it, but that light burned out, and we haven't. It's pretty high and hasn't been replaced yet, but we need to. Look what get that has. light fixed at some point and um, so we can see it. The broken glass in the Tiffany windows is the back of Christ's head in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's a second panel down from the top. And my eye always goes to it every time I'm, I'm in church. So it's, it's, uh, Christ is looking away from us um, with his arms stretched out. Um, and it's the back of his head. That's part of the back of his head. So some of his hair is one color and the rest of it has, has uh, the color has gone more to gray rather than the whatever the darker color it was. Uh, Kachaturian is the same name. Armenians pronounce it Kachaturian and the, the letter T doesn't exist in our, in our uh, language. Um, so if some people uh, go to T and some people go to D. So the sound is actually between T and D, which is a T. Uh, <laughs> apparently he, and I was told this by someone, because we came to church around 1980, which is only a few years after, three years after the church had reopened, <clears throat> that he walked around the construction site with a pocket knife. And he stuck his pocket knife into the beams and the columns. And if you could actually stick it in there, but then that beam had to go. <laughs> if he couldn't stick it in there, the beam was good enough. So he gauged the, the quality of the, of the wood by how far he could put his pocket knife into it. And that was, this is the experience that he had gotten from, from restoring uh, uh, churches in London. Uh, all the beams that you see and the columns that you see in the sanctuary now 
are veneered. <clears throat> Majority of that lumber stayed. And if you were to peel away the veneer layer, and we had to do see. that when we rewired uh, the lighting back about um, 20, 20 years ago or so, you can see, you can still see the charred beams underneath it. So they're all still there. They've just been covered over. Uh, and a lot, of, uh, a lot of the burnt beams are still existing uh, in the attic, which is above the assembly room. There's a large space up there. And a lot of the beams you can see that were sistered with new beams uh, to strengthen them. But a lot of those burnt beams are still up there. So that's what I had to tell about that. Mark? Thank you. Mark? Yeah. Hannah. This is the cross uh, that Betty had. Oh. Uh, and on the back, it says, presented to Betty Bailey, UCC Rededication Weekend, April 29 to May 1. 1977. Oh, that's wonderful. And it was it, it was one of those it was made. One of the made from salvaged timber as well. Right. Yeah. Oh wow. And Larry, uh, Larry, <laughs> in our exchange of notes, pointed out. Um, Larry, maybe you want to describe this, but on the Tiffany windows, uh, they found when they took off the protective glass, there was another layer underneath that that was kind of this greenish tint glass that had been put on back in 1920. And that was removed in the restoration. And so the really bright, clear colors of the glass come through now. They'd been a little duller before that because of the greenish uh, protective glass. Is that right, Larry? Yeah, that, that's correct. Uh, I, I guess back in the 50s and, and before, they considered the Tiffany windows too, uh, like too bright and almost sacrilegious. Uh, and they... <laughs> Uh, after the fire, we decided that, uh, wow, these are beautiful windows and they should be displayed in all their glory. Uh, and, and that's the way they are now. Yeah. Hmm. Any Cam, sense I'm that there was uh, any kind of um, either, uh, perhaps Larry, you might remember this, any sense of remorse from the boys that, um, that started the fire and any attempts at reconciling with them in, in any way, any kind of outreach that was done or any kind of relationship that existed beyond the, the night? Uh, yeah, I, I um, remember that at least one of the boys uh, re regretted what he had done. And I, I'm not sure exactly what happened to the others. Um, uh, I, I yeah I, I can't remember. I, t Tim said it was three boys. I I, I thought it might have been four, but I, I can't remember for sure. Uh, and yeah, they, they they were local boys. They they were right from the neighborhood. Uh, and they I guess one night they just decided to just uh, I don't know do something wild and crazy. And uh, Dave, the uh, the newspaper reports say that that. Uh, I mean, it took until the following August to identify them and for them to be arrested. The uh, Jim Gilliam and the others really, uh, you know, uh, there needed to be punishment, but wanted to modify it. Bill Lutz uh, offered to for counseling and that sort of thing. One of the boys had found he was just in the wrong, Bill says he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And, and so Jim Gilliam worked to have him uh, sent to a to a place in Pennsylvania that the United Church of Christ ran. Um, um, so he did. Um, um, it's not clear. I, I think the other two had uh, were certainly got involved in the juvenile justice system, hmm. but there was an effort to uh, um, for a quality of mercy as well. Tim, I have an interesting parallel that occurred in the church that I served for the last 10 years of my ministry in Warwick on a Sunday evening in 1972 before the youth met, met two of the boys were upstairs in the choir room smoking. And when they were called to the meeting, they put their cigarettes out in the couch. Okay. Um, the meeting occurred and everybody left the building and then it burned down, of course. 
the um, sanctuary itself uh, was the again the main center of damage as this choir room was above and behind the altar. It uh, too was a big stone church like ours uh, with a lot of Tiffany glass windows, all of which were saved. Uh, and the interior was pretty much uh, gutted through the roof, etc. cetera. Uh, these two boys uh, were members of the congregation and still live in Warwick and you can go talk to them. Um, <laughs> it's wow. uh, kind of a, just a curious parallel, I thought, yeah. between uh, the fires uh, in the similar kind of churches. Uh, yeah, some are around the same time, too. Yeah, 72. They have the pulpit Bible was, was snatched off, off the pulpit. Uh, it's charred, but it remains in a case there. Yeah. And, uh, uh, some interesting parallels, but those uh, those boys probably are living had to live with this the rest of their lives as as these two boys had to as well. Tim, I've got a budget question for you, and that is uh, if the capital campaign in 1975 was one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars, do you have any idea what the annual budget was for the church at that time? No, I should know that, um, but I, um, I, I would think it'd probably be somewhere around a couple hundred thousand dollars, maybe a little bit less. Because uh, I'm just trying to yeah. figure out what kind of an impact that had on the congregation to raise that money. Yeah. That's a whole nother uh, uh, discussion, uh, Bruce, because uh, uh, the church is, 400 and how old are we are we are we now? we're 140 years old now um uh, uh it always comes up a little short <laughs> and then there's an effort to raise the money to kind of bridge the gap um uh you know i put a, together a whole nother set of slides that might do that another time on changes in in the interior in the church and such over the, over time but uh one of the first things that the church had to decide back in when, the, when it opened in 1900, 1901, um, when we moved to the, from the Valley Road Church building was, um, and probably had pews for the first time. I, I think that presumed the church did not have pews for the first 20 years, um, uh, was whether to charge a pew rental because that was instead of annual pledges, you kind of basically bought a pew. Um, and that had been the traditional way of funding a Protestant church for about, a, I don't know, 100 years or so. And, and uh, uh, Union was one of the first congregational churches to kind of drop the pew charge. Um, and, but there were questions at the time that, that, well, you had the pew, but if you weren't there in church, could somebody else use the pew? So it was, it was kind of a, a bizarre situation. <laughs> But uh, funding it uh, uh, is, is a perennial issue. Funding the work of the church is a perennial issue. In Brooklyn, the pews um, rented for about $100 uh, a year. Um, in the church that I served, the, the better pews were considered to be in the front at the time. And oh. in the summer, the usher's job was to make sure that no one sat in the well-to-do parishioners' pews. <laughs> <laughs> at the summer places. Michael, could you sublet those pews? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah we all get hung up on pews, and in many ways, I, I wonder if we'd all be better off without pews, just to <laughs> let, let the spirit flow a little bit better. Tim, I have a question, historically speaking, and, and obviously we're new to the church, so we're not really familiar with the history. Um, we live on Watchung Avenue, and down the street from us is the Watchung Church. Yeah. Yeah, there had been a Mark fire there the as well, story. right? <laughs> that there had been a fire there as well. Was yes. the same, the same time? Yeah, yeah. Mark, you um, uh, you were members yes. of Watchung at the fire, right? Yes, we were members at the time of the fire, and I can remember Betty saying at one point, "What's wrong with me? We seem to belong to churches that uh, have fires." <laughs> <laughs> Do you recall what year the Wachung Church burned? <clears throat> it was 1974, I think. Early I think, I, I, yeah, because, because uh, uh, there was a, a period of time when people thought they could, could rejuvenate that church. 
and it was just impossible. And um, so uh, there was a gradual movement away from it, and a group came to Union. Yeah. At, I mean, at the same time. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's not a no-brainer when a church burns. Do uh, you have the strength, yeah. the, the fortitude, the, the support to uh, rebuild and continue? So, uh, um, you know, I think it may be the same after this pandemic. There may be churches that just don't really survive. Yeah. And it takes an act of will on behalf of the congregation to oh, yeah. um, watching, to I'm figure out how best to uh, proceed I'm after a time of testing. I have to get a couple of things yeah. together anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. Guys, um, if Nick is coming up to 10 o'clock, uh, um, unless there's some pressing questions, I'd really like to thank Tim enormously. Yeah. Oh, for, that was um, just amazing. It's fabulous. Yeah, it was a great job. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much, Tim. Yeah. Um, hey, Tim, hey, Tim one, one thing I just wanted to say, which I really appreciated about this incredible presentation that I think is a lesson for us today as we consider changes to our worship and the sanctuary and what have you, is the way you humanized this presentation, the way you, um, you know, gave uh, kudos to so many of the people who were involved. And I think that's a really important lesson for us as we consider these changes, to be mindful of affirming the different roles that people have in, in the process that is before us. And I really uh, am grateful for your modeling that for us uh, as we go about whatever changes are to come because of the pandemic. So thank you for that. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Really outstanding. Yeah. Really right. amazing. Thank, thank you, Tim. Thank you so much, Thanks. Tim. And I, and I want to make a quick uh, plug for next uh, month's <laughs> breakfast uh, when Matt, uh, Matt Newsen, who is a, um, a cartographer, I'm not quite sure if that's the word, but he works in the New York Public Library Maps Department, and he is going to be giving us a, a talk on his work in, um, in, in, the, in the New York uh, Public Library's Map Department. Yep. Nick, I, right. Nick, I'd like to point out that uh, he was head of cartography for the New York Public Library System for about a decade, and he was promoted a couple of years ago. He is now the president of the uh, New York Public Library System. Wow. No, he's not president. He's the head of all the research uh, uh, departments in the library. OK. Uh, yeah, but he, he has a very senior role at the New York Public Library. And he did some fantastic work with their map collection beforehand. So yeah, uh, but it be great. Available. It's an interesting My, uh, my fifth great grandfather was the one that uh, surveyed and mapped the island of Manhattan. And uh, that was submitted on, in 1811. And in 2011, they had this massive celebration for 200 years. And Matt came up to me in the assembly room and said, Scott, where were you? And I said, <laughs> and I, said I didn't know about it. And, uh, but at any rate, yes. Yeah. That, that'd be great to hear from Matt. Dave, Dave, you said you wanted to say something? Dave, yeah. I have a quick request. Um, tomorrow we're doing a very uh, different kind of communion liturgy. I'm looking for two additional readers, please. And I get two volunteers to read tomorrow. I will email you later in the day with the reading. Carlos is one. You can read. Mike Spinell is two. Thank you. Right. Gentlemen, this was a wonderful morning. Thank you so much for your time. Special thanks to Tim. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, All right. Tim. Thanks. Well done. Good weekend. Well done. All Thank right. you. Thanks, Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you all soon. God bless.